Hello and welcome to this book summary where we're looking at the book Atomic Habits by James Clear. Now it's very easy to underestimate the value of making small improvements on a daily basis. Too often we convince ourselves that massive success requires massive action. Why should we try and get a little better each day? Well, because if you can get just 1% better each day over the next year, you'll be 37 times better by the time you're done. Now, this applies to all goals, whether they're losing weight, winning a race, or starting a business. Now, according to Atomic Habits, habits are the compound interest of self-improvement. The same way that money multiplies through compound interest, the effect of your habits multiplies as you repeat them. They seem to make little or even no difference on any given day, but the impact they deliver over months or years can be enormous. Now, bad habits compound too. Putting off a project to tomorrow seems to make no difference. But when you repeat this type of 1% error day after day after day, these tiny errors can be compounded into toxic results. Success is the product of daily habits, not once in a lifetime transformations. But be aware that your outcomes will lag behind your habits. So for example, your wealth is a lagging measure of your savings habits. And because of this lag factor, you should be far more concerned with your current trajectory than with your current results. Now, the hallmark of any compound process is that the most powerful outcomes are delayed. So habits appear to make no difference until we cross a threshold and unlock a new level of performance. The plateau of latent potential shows us why it can be hard to build habits. You make a change, but fail to see any tangible result, and you decide to give up. Habits need to persist long enough to break through this plateau, and that's going to take time. Goals are the results that you want to achieve, and systems are about the processes that lead to those results. Now, Atomic Habits states that if you focus on the system, the goal will take care of itself. Now, why is this? Well, firstly, because winners and losers have the same goals. So every Olympian wants to win a gold medal. Every entrepreneur wants to be successful. Thus, it's the system of the winners that gets them those results and not the goals because everyone shares the same goal. Secondly, because achieving a goal is only a momentary change. If our goal is to tidy a room and we tidy it, then we've hit our goal. But without changing our system, we'll soon be looking at a messy room again. Also, goals restrict your happiness. Our implicit assumption is once I reach my goal, then I'll be happy. But that sets us up to fail because either you achieve your goal, but you don't feel fulfilled, or you fail to achieve your goal and that makes you feel unhappy. And also because goals are at odds with long-term progress. Now, many people will train hard to complete a marathon, but when the marathon is over, they completely stop running. Now, the goal of running the marathon was their motivation, but now it's gone, so they stop. So if you're having trouble changing your habits, the problem isn't you. The problem is your system. Focusing on the overall system rather than a single goal is one of the core themes of Atomic Habits. You do not rise to the level of your goals. Instead, you fall to the level of your system. So it's all about system, not goals. The three layers of behavior change. You can think about outcomes as being about what you get. Processes are about what you do. And identity is about what you believe. So when people set out to to improve, they just think, I want to be skinny. And if I stick to this diet, then I'll be skinny. So they're thinking about the outcome and then thinking about the process they need to follow to achieve that outcome. What they don't realize is that their old identity can sabotage their plans for change. So for example, you might want better health, but if you continue to prioritize comfort over accomplishment, you'll be drawn to relaxing rather than training. So it's hard to change your habits if you don't change your underlying beliefs that led to your previous behavior. So true behavior change is identity change. You might start a habit because of motivation, but the only reason you stick with one 
is because it becomes part of your identity. Now, good habits can make sense rationally, but if they conflict with your identity, you will fail to maintain them. Your identity is formed through evidence. So if you run, even when it's snowing, you have some evidence that you're a runner. But it doesn't just happen with one run. It's a gradual process that might even take years. Now, every action you take is a vote for the type of person you wish to become. No single instance will transform your beliefs. But as the votes build up, so does the evidence of your new identity. So here's a simple two-step process for change. One, decide the type of person you want to be. And two, prove it to yourself with small wins, small atomic habits every day. And this will set up a feedback loop. Your habits will shape your identity, but then eventually your identity will start to shape your habits. Habits work like this. First, there is the cue. The cue triggers your brain to initiate a behavior because it predicts a reward. Next, you have the craving. What you crave is not the habit itself, but the change in state it delivers. The response is the actual habit you perform, and this can be a thought or an action. And finally, the response delivers a reward. Now, the four steps together form a neurological feedback loop, cue, craving, response, reward, cue, craving, response, reward, that ultimately allow you to create automatic habits. This is the habit loop. So Atomic Habits provides a framework we can use to transform the four steps of the habit loop so that we can design good habits and eliminate bad ones. So if you want to design good habits, we need to make it obvious, we need to make it attractive, we need to make it easy, and we need to make it satisfying. Conversely, if you want to break bad habits, then you need to make it invisible, make it unattractive, make it difficult, and make it unsatisfying. Now note that the method of breaking a bad habit is always just the opposite of building a good one. Let's examine each law in a bit more detail and in each section we'll look at one way to boost your good habits along with an inversion showing you how to break bad habits. So the first law is make it obvious and according to Atomic Habits one of the best ways to build a new habit is to identify an existing habit and then stack a new behavior on top of it. And this is called habit stacking. So an example might be, after I shower in the morning, I will meditate. Or another example would be, as soon as I take off my shoes after work, I will spend 30 minutes learning French. Now, once you begin to master how to do this, you can create larger stacks by chaining habits together. Now, habit st stacking works best when the cue is highly specific and immediately actionable. Now, as an inversion, we have the secret of self-control. Bad habits are autocatalytic. They feed themselves. They promote the feelings they try to numb. So for example, you feel bad, so you eat junk food. But because you've eaten junk food, you feel bad. Now, the idea that self-discipline can solve our bad habits is deeply embedded within our culture. Research, however, shows something different. It shows that disciplined people spend less time in tempting situations. And a practical way to remove a bad habit, therefore, is to reduce exposure to the cue that causes it. So for example, if you regularly feel like you're not enough, then stop using social media that trigger, triggers your jealousy and your envy. And this practice is an inversion of the first law of behavior change. Rather than make it obvious, we want to make it invisible. Self-control is short-term, not long-term. The second law is make it attractive. And te temptation bundling is a way to create a more desirable version of a habit by connecting it with something you already want. Now, temptation bundling can be used to make most habits more attractive than they would be otherwise. And temptation bundling basically says that you're more likely to find, find a behavior attractive if you get to do one of your favorite things at the same time. So for example, you want to know some celebrity gossip, but you also need to get in shape. Then using temptation bundling, you could only read gossip magazines at the gym. Now, temptation bundling can be used in conjunction with habit stacking. 
to create a set of rules to guide your behavior. Now, your bad habits are modern solutions to ancient desires, new versions of old vices. The underlying motive behind the way you behave remains the same. So for example, if your underlying motive is to find love, your habit might be using Tinder. If your underlying motive is to achieve social acceptance, your habit might be posting on Instagram. Now, why is this important? Well, it's important because there are many different ways to address the same underlying motive. You might reduce your stress by going for a run, or you might reduce your stress by smoking a cigarette. Your current habits are not necessarily the best way to solve your problems. They are just simply the methods you've learned to use. So when you binge eat, what you really want isn't a potato chip. What you want is to change the way you feel. The cravings you experience and then the habits you perform are an attempt to address the underlying motives. So when a habit is successful in addressing a motive, you develop a craving to do it again and again. And in time, you learn to predict that checking Instagram, for example, will make you feel accepted. Now, a simple way to make a bad habit seem unattractive is to try and find a better way of meeting your underlying motive. So if you eat because you want to feel better, then maybe next time you want to feel better, you could try going for a run. It's easy to get bogged down in trying to find the optimal plan for change. Often we get so focused on figuring out the best approach, we forget to actually take action. And the book has this concept of motion versus action. So when you're in motion, you're planning and you're strategizing, and that's very different from actually taking action. It's only action that can directly lead to actual results or actual outcomes. But if motion doesn't lead to results, then why do we do it? Well, sometimes we need to plan and learn, but more often than not, motion allows us to feel as though we're making progress without running the risk of failure. Motion makes us feel like we're getting things done, but actually you're not, you're just preparing to get something done. If you want to build a habit, you need repetition, not perfection, you need action. So how long does it take to form a habit? Well, actually, that's the wrong question. The real question should be how many reps does it take to form a habit? Because habits are based on frequency, not time. So your current habits have been internalized over hundreds or maybe even thousands of repetitions. New habits will require the same level of frequency. Now, atomic habits might just take a short moment to complete but they can continue to impact your behavior for hours afterward. And the two minute rule utilizes this fact by saying, when you start a new habit, it should take less than two minutes to do. So for example, you want to read more, then maybe you could read a page a day. Or how about you want to write more, then maybe you could simply write one sentence per day. And there are two reasons why the two minute rule works. So firstly, it's a gateway habit, and that means it naturally leads you down the road to a more productive path. Secondly, it reinforces the identity you want to build. If you show up at the gym seven days a week, even if it's just for five minutes, you're becoming the type of person who doesn't miss workouts. A key point here is to simply get started. You can worry about improving your atomic habit later but you cannot improve a habit that doesn't exist. So let's look at the inversion. Sometimes success is less about making good habits easy and more about making bad habits hard. Now, one way to do this is by using something called a commitment device. And this is a choice you make in the present to control your actions in the future. Now, a commitment device makes bad habits impractical to do they increase the friction until you don't even have the option to act. So for example, the average person spends two hours per day on social media. Now, would you like to have an extra 600 hours per year? Then maybe you could ask your partner to change your social media passwords every Monday morning and only give them back to you on Friday evening. And you'll be surprised how much extra time 
you gain during each week using this kind of commitment device. Next, we have strategic one-time decisions. And these are things you only have to do once, but that keep on giving and giving. So for example, if you want to improve the quality of your sleep, you could buy a blackout blind. If you wanted to improve your mental health, then maybe you could get a dog. And thirdly, we have technology. Now, this is especially useful when habits aren't something you do every day. So for example, you could use an app to automate your savings each month or to automate your bill paying every month. Now, the fourth law is make it satisfying. You're more likely to repeat a behavior when you find the experience satisfying. As humans, it can be hard to pick up new habits. And that's because the beginning of a new habit is mostly sacrifice without reward. You go to the gym a few times and nothing happens. It takes months to see real results. And this difficulty is compounded because the human brain has evolved to prioritize immediate rewards over delayed rewards. So if you want to get a habit to stick, you need to figure out a way to give yourself an immediate reward. Now, one technique you can use when the reward is long-term is to set up a loyalty system for yourself. So imagine you want to give up alcohol. Now, on its own, there is no real satisfaction in simply abstaining. But what if you've transferred $25 to your holiday bank account every week you went without alcohol? You'd be immediately rewarding yourself for your new habit. Now, eventually, the intrinsic reward, such as better moods and more energy kick in, and you'll no longer need the reward as it's your identity that will be changing. Now, while the first three laws of behavior change make it obvious, attractive, and easy, increase the odds that a behavior will be performed, the fourth law, make it satisfying, increases the odds that the behavior will be repeated. To stick to your habits, the book recommends using a habit tracker. Why? Well, because they create a visual cue that reminds you to act. They're motivating because you see the progress you're making and don't want the streak to stop. It's satisfying to put another X on your tracker each day. And finally, they provide visual proof that you're casting votes for the type of person you want to become. Now, things inevitably go wrong from time to time and you will break your streak. And when this happens, try to get a new streak started as quickly as possible. Now, missing once is an accident, but missing twice is the start of a new habit. And this is the difference between winners and losers. Anyone can perform badly once, but when successful people fail, they rebound quickly. The inversion of the fourth law is to make it unsatisfying. We are less likely to repeat a bad habit if it is painful and unsatisfying in the moment. Now, one way to do this is to create an immediate consequence using a habit contract. Now, these make the cost of violating your promises public and painful. So, for example, every time you eat junk food, you could post on Facebook saying that you've been unhealthy and offer $20 via PayPal to the first person to respond. Now, An accountability partner can be really helpful with this too. Accountability partners work because we care about what others think about us and we don't want them to have a poor opinion of us. Now, the fact we know someone is watching can have a huge impact on how we behave. Now, finally, we have an advanced topic we're going to cover around gaining mastery. It's precisely at the moment when you begin to feel like you've mastered a skill that you must avoid complacently so that you progress to the next level. So what's the solution? Well, the book recommends establishing a system for reflection and review, and that's going to enable you to objectively see what's working and what isn't, and based on this, make better plans going forward. Now, most people use a weekly review or a monthly review or a six month review, It depends on what stage you're at and what you're trying to achieve. So in summary, atomic habits are small habits that can have a huge impact if performed over months or even years. Now, the goal isn't to make a single 1% improvement, but to make thousands of them. It's lots of atomic habits stacking up, each part of a system 
that eventually creates huge impact. Now, at the start, small improvements often seem meaningless, even if you logically know that they're the right thing to do. Gradually though, as you continue to stack small changes on top of one another, the scales start to tip in your favor. Eventually, if you stick with it, you hit a tipping point. Suddenly, it's easier to stick with good habits and the overall system is working for you rather than against you. Now, although there's nothing new in the book Atomic Habits, I found it pulled lots of different ideas together in a really cohesive way. I also found the four laws of behavior change simple to remember and really easy to implement. On the downside, sometimes I felt sections were written without having any real actionable steps at the end of them, and I was left wondering how to implement what I'd just read. But overall, I really think it's a great book, and I give Atomic Habits a really solid 9 out of 10. So that's it. Really hope you enjoyed this summary, and I look forward to speaking to you again soon.